This is the poet and the poem from the Library of Congress. We're on location. I am with Terry Edmonds, and I knew him as a poet uh, 30 years ago. He's still going strong, and it's a thrill to present his newly published book. So Terry, give us a taste of this new book. Thank you so much, Grace, for, uh, for having me. Uh, the first poem that I'm going to read is called Thank God for the Low Life. And I wrote this poem, I was, I grew up in the projects of, of Baltimore and, uh, but in the early seventies, when I uh, came out of Morgan State University, I got into the professional world, but I was, I was um, experiencing what uh, W.E.B. Du Bois called double consciousness, mm -hmm. where, you know, I didn't fit in with the, uh, the professional world, the white professional world, the mainstream world. And I was also um, sort of, you know, uh, estranged even from my, from my uh, roots in the, in the inner city. But uh, so this poem reflects my sort of uh, uh, conflict about, uh, about those things. And uh, it, it, it celebrates the fact that um, things that some people may consider low life are really high life. Thank God for the low life. Thank God for the low life. Everybody's not a yuppie. Thank God for the dreadlock, unlocked doors, black ocean walks in the clock dead night. For the unpolitical sun, wild geese resting in families on the frozen lake, flying off in formation, they have no keys to keep. For the too many nights, up too late, dancing and drinking and smoking herbs. I keep paying my tabs with checks that almost bounce. <laughs> my hat size is the same, but the world is shrinking. Don't get me wrong now. Unemployment's not my gig, but working is not working. Harry Edmonds, no one writes like you do. These are little bullets. I mean, each one, many of your poems, not all of them are very small, but every line is a bullet of meaning. And I love Unpolitical Sons, yes. Unpolitical Sons. Now you have a chapbook by this name. Yes, I wrote that, I think in the late eighties. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's called, yeah, Thank God for the Low Life. I, I was at that time uh, affiliated with Apathy Press, a Baltimore press. Uh, I don't know if you know Tommy DeVente. Tom DeVente, know okay. him well. You know Tommy. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he he helped me publish that uh, chat book. And there and, was another one you published, which is uh, to hear this message again, press 10. You always yes. have humor beneath your meanings. So yes. this book is uh, in two languages. And I would like to have you speak a little bit about the value of having a book in more than one language. Yes, uh, my publisher is a guy named Roberto Mendez, Mendoza Ayala, and he has uh, Mexican roots. And he, uh, it's, it's called Dark Light Publishing. And uh, he typically likes to publish his books in both English and Spanish. And uh, that sort of expands the, the reach of the poetry. Uh, it reaches, uh, you know, non-English uh, speakers. And um, I, I'm, I don't speak Spanish, so I'm depending on him to get it right. And I, I trust him. So, uh, you know, he, he's also uh, distributed this book in Mexico and, uh, and, and through and some, and some, some oh. uh, pieces. That is exciting. That is very exciting. You know, I was thinking how we take this almost for granted when we see two languages, but this is very precious to cross that bridge. When I was a little girl, Terry, there was nothing on the shelf but white British poets like Kipling, you know, yeah. which I read, that's all there was. But there was no imagination that there would be poems that would be crossing nations. So I can't tell people enough how this should be honored and supported really. Yes. So yes. Um, you are 
involved with the translation, but when you wrote it in English, then you turned it over to them. Is that how it yes. happened? Yes, yes. I wrote it in English and I trusted them to translate it into Spanish. And you're giving a reading soon. Is there any chance of having a Spanish speaker ever read with you someday? Yes, yes. That would be great because that would be double whammy. Yeah. Terry yeah. Edmonds yeah. is born and bred in Baltimore. And he is a name that was well honored in the Baltimore art scene uh, because I was there and I know. And he's going to give you two more poems now from his new book. Tell us the title of the book. The title of the book is called Question Marks. Uh, and it, it just reflects my uh, curious mind and uh, some of the experiences that I've, I've had throughout my life that have raised questions and that have uh, stimulated me. Uh, this next poem is called Say His Name Too. And this is in memory of one-year-old Deval Gardner Jr., who was killed by gunfire while sitting in his stroller on July 12th, 2020 in his Bedford Stuyvesant Stuyves uh, Brooklyn, New York neighborhood uh, during an outdoor barbecue. Uh, it's a short poem, but uh, I hope it does justice to the subject. Say his name too. We dance to the inconsistent drumbeat of a Brooklyn knight in armor. Smoke hangs heavy as cement over a half-lit bar playground barbecue. There is no why in the alphabet of our intentions. A sudden stroke of fire cracks the strolling slumber. Wonder struck by thunder, there is no reason why, nestled in the bosom of July, a bed baby cries, no more. Mm. Give us those last two lines again because they are pure lyrical. Wonder struck by thunder, there is no reason why, nestled in the bosom of July, a bed baby cries, no more. Mm, those, boy, those few words say it all. Let's have another from this new book, please. To keep this child's name alive is to make it permanent. And that's one job of the poet. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. This next one is called A Visitation. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll be turning 74 in September. And uh, a lot of people in my generation are starting to expire or to transition. And uh, I, one of my best friends is in a nursing home in Baltimore. Mm. I, uh, this this was um, this poem was inspired by a visit that I made to him. It's called a visitation. The septic scent of half buried bones greets my arrival. More spirit than flesh, I move like mist down a long wheelchaired hospice hallway, past countless years of numbered doors to visit with an old friend and a messy bed of memories. I've come to mourn the ones who held me tight, now barely holding on, the ones who have abandoned gravity. I cannot be unaffected by the dying of my generation, no matter how distant, no matter how much now, the breath of you still keeps me alive keeps my heart beating. I will not be unaffected by your leaving, even as these pains of love and loss give birth to life without you. Abandoned gravity. Yes. The poet is Terry Edmonds. And the book is question marks. How many of us have walked that hallway? Yes. You know, I was going to ask you about poetry activism. And as I listened to that, I realized that activism was more than uh, an approach to society, that it has to do with the courage of unleashing feelings. What do you think about 
that in terms of activism as well? Well, you, you know, say it, the truth. I think it's a very complicated question about um, about activism because um, you know every poet has to decide what their issues are and what they care about. Um, for me, what poetry does is you know puts language to complex emotions and helps unravel uh, feelings, deep feelings. Um, but I do believe, you know, uh, you know, I'm influenced by the Black arts movement and, and poets like Baraka and Gwendolyn Brooks, Lucille Clifton, Langston Hughes. Uh, and so a lot of my poetry does deal with current issues and social consciousness. Uh, and so I, I, um, I believe that poetry does have a role to play in that. Uh, although I don't think it's the only role it needs to play because mm. sometimes it can just simply delight you know, <laughs> with a poem. It doesn't have to uh, have a, a, a uh, social uh, impact purpose. Well said, well said. I hope everybody listens to that one. It's also true that poetry honors subjects with language the way prose does not. It's like mm -hmm. we put on our best party dress <laughs> to write. Um, poetry cares about the best, the highest, the cleanest, the most original language. And that way it honors the subject just by that, it seems yes. to me, mm -hmm. which you do. Terry Edmonds, this is the book. It is question marks. And we're going to hear two more poems. Okay. Um, speaking of social consciousness, this is another one that's sort of in that vein. It's called Dedications. A toast. This is for the man draped in raggedy blankets, slip sliding on a rickety hard rock. Falling and never regaining his balance, he greets me with a weary look I try but cannot hide. This is for the woman, the beautiful woman, in full control of my emptiness. Her warm, sexy body, her sad, craving smile leave me speechless. For the absentee father, locked up in prison, off to the war, to the streets, off to the fading factory. His undying love is not an illusion. This is for the babies, soft in their skin, speaking so much wisdom with their baby cries and baby eyes. For the tied down, boxed up, locked and loaded, till parted by death, our raging whispers, our clamoring voices try, but cannot hide the love inside. Tough stuff, but it's so transcendent. And I, the full control of my emptiness is a phrase that only could have written by a poet, right? <laughs> uh, let's go on with this book because every page is a absolutely worth reading. You know, sometimes I read a book of poems and I say, there's always about six poems I go back to and no matter who wrote this book, but every page of your book is something memorable and yeah. i want to hear another page Thank terry you. edmonds born and bred in baltimore uh, i think he has his life between uh bridged between new york city and baltimore where there is still family he was yeah. part of the great art scene of the 80s uh and his name is still well known there for good stuff thank you thank you this one is called arrogance and this is another question what makes us think that we, a few inches of skin and insides, cosmic stowaways, spending our many lives forgetting the way home, what makes us think love does not outlive us? What makes us think that we, the countless, temporary, unaffiliated, dying ones, playing the game of mortal, what makes us think love needs us to survive? Mm. When I think of a poet being the speechwriter for Bill Clinton, 
It blows my mind. Tell me how that happened. I know you were an executive that dealt with PR. Is that how you, he found you? Yes, that's how he found me. Um, I, uh, I joined the Clinton administration in 1993, first writing po uh, speeches for Donna Shalala, who was at that time the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And then after two years, I went over to the White House and started writing for Bill Clinton and uh, ended up as his chief speechwriter. So that was a highlight of my professional career, um, but uh, it also helped me, you know, keep my writing, uh, you know, muscles going. So uh, it, it was- Harry, how scared does a person have to be to write something and show it to the president? I mean, yes. you had to have much self-confidence. Well, it, it was a very, uh, yes, tenuous. I, I always say it was the most uh, exhilarating, exhausting, and rewarding experience of my life. Uh, and writing for the president, especially for someone like Bill Clinton, who was a great orator and a great writer, too, in, in his own right. Uh, yes, it was a little bit daunting, but... Uh, uh, he was a great guy to work for, and I, I really enjoyed working with him. Did and, his assistance change anything much? Oh, uh, he did. He changed <laughs> much. And you're right. The uh, writing speeches for the president uh, is is a very collaborative mm -hmm. exercise. And so a lot of eyes and fingers go into it. Uh, sometimes when I would write a draft, uh, at the end, when he gave it, it didn't look like <laughs> anything that I gave. It. But, but when uh, you've got a subject, I can just visualize this thinking, oh, my God, what, how am I going to begin this? Was the beginning always the hardest thing to do? Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, when I was writing for him, it was before, you know, the age of social media and Google and all of that. So we had to go to real libraries <laughs> and uh, talk to real people to get the facts uh, mm. straight. And uh, you had to get the facts straight because mm. you're writing for someone who could, uh, you know, uh, the consequences were really, uh, you know, severe. Don't we wish we had that standard today? Yes. Where yes. truth mattered and yes. facts were facts. Yes. Terry Edmonds has had a great career as an executive a public figure poet though will last as long as we do so let's go back to the poetry this poem is called bad news and it's written for my brother jerome who is now deceased bad news my big brother taught me how to tie a tie tied it round the bunk bed post taught me how to jitterbug. Basketball tall, he shot the ball, shot the bobo, lots of beers and shots. Like time and the seasons, he was all the way live, always fading. A brother so good, they called him bad news. In 69, a part of him sent off to war, a year and change a part of him and war returned. One afternoon, early morning, some wounded years later, we got the bad news. A ticking time explosion, and from the dust arose a dancing shadow. I am his big brother now. Mm. Yeah. Some wounded years later. Do you think his demise was connected with his? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, 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 Vietnam experience. Yes, he, he developed some, you know, self-destructive behaviors and, you know, some depression. Uh, after. Absolutely. I understand that. Did he ever read your poetry? Uh, because you were writing um, in the 60s. Did, did he ever know you were a poet? I, yes, he did know. Um, uh, yes, but he wasn't much into poetry, but yes, he knew. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Because this is an, a memorial to him that I wish he would hear. I, I wish he would hear. Yeah. Um, do you know, you have a poem that I like very much that I wonder if you would mind reading. It's page 26. Okay. 
it's just it just to me has so much vitality uh, yeah. and motion. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Is that uh, anybody know what the number was today? Uh, yes, yep. the poem is called "Anybody Know What the Number Was Today?" or quantitative analysis. Counting stars, counting sheep, both put me to sleep. But some sad scientist stays up all night and counting. How many days in a week? How long is a day when you've been hijacked or sold into slavery? What's your blood type? Does it change after death? How many laps can you swim? How many times can the superpowers blow us up? How many kids do you have? Are you parenting? What's the unemployment rate for black males over 40 in Iowa? Are, we, are whales really smarter than humans? How many shopping days till Christmas? How much did you spend last year? Are you overweight? Can you say your ABCs? Did you get good grades? Did you get a good evaluation? Quantitatively speaking, in all probability, approximately 10% of most Americans are living outside the statistical state. At what angle did the bullet enter? Is Tupac really dead? Kill her last line. Kill her <laughs> last line. Unexpected last line. And um, you do so much with your questions. They, they reach so broadly into our lives. Each one could be a discussion, couldn't it? A seminar. Okay. Yes. It's one of those yes. lines. Okay, we're getting a lot of it, of this book, and I want more. I want more, Terry Edmonds. Okay. 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 Um, keeping with the um, social impact theme, this next poem is about the uh, immigration crisis that's affecting not only the United States, but the world. Um, and I begin with a uh, epigraph by a woman named Washon Shire. She's a poet and an activist. And she writes, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. Mm. River migrant, swept off the land by invisible hands of failing to grasp what is a treasure. He pays a final morning visit to water's edge. Seduced by the wink and wave of soft river ripples, unprotected from falling, he boards a rotting bloated boat. Turtle back stones like dead fish float. Trees are slowly turning into bricks of shadows. His drowning eyes take flight in skies of wild geese flying backwards. You know, uh, I'm going to ask you to read Turbulence because to me it fits with that in a very nuanced way. I have Tur it on 106. Yes, I have it here. Turbulence. Now this one um, is more of, about climate change and about the, the devastation that we're doing to our, to our planet. Turbulence. Cruising 1500 feet sub zero, mid flight above the Arctic. Ancient peaks of stone edged passion peek through clouds, half dressed in flimsy blankets of wind-blown snow. The only sound, a slightly offbeat crackle of watercolor blue ice melting, echoes of warming extinction. A huddle of shivering penguins sit shiver for the planet tonight. Mm. From every man-made bird's eye view, the rising sea murmurs, peace, be still, no more. Perry Edmonds, sit shiver for the planet. Please give us a final poem. Okay. We won't forget you in a hurry. All right, thank you. Well, I'll just give you the, the, the uh, 
the title of the book, question marks. And um, it's very short, somewhat esoteric, but hopefully it hits the mark, question marks. Do I have the courage to be the unimaginable me? Is that courage or something far worse? Do I have the right to step outside of everything? Is my body willing and able? My godness, my goodness, are they one in the same? Am I okay my treasures do not fit in paper bags or boxes? Mm -hmm. Can I make peace? This is the only it there is. The answer is yes. <laughs> they are the same. I have to say your godness and your goodness are both the same. So I wanted to answer one of your questions. This yes. is the poet in the poem. Our poet has been Terry Edmonds. The program is produced by Forestwood Media Productions, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Funding is provided by the Maryland State Arts Council, the Ravada Fund, the Sinipid Fund, and Sydney, um, Natalie Canavore, and Sandy Jackson Cohen. Mike Turpins, our engineer, and I'm Grace Cavalieri.